get out here. Thank you, uh, Team Lucky Peach, Team Noma. We're just thrilled and honored to be here. This is just an amazing, amazing experience. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to start off the presentation with a very short video to show you a little bit more in detail of perhaps why we were invited here today. You want to stop? Um, it's, it's not any news any longer that farmers and chefs have collaborations. We, we know that. We know it's not a new concept. I mean, a dozen years ago when, um, before we even started out, David Kinch and I, there were just a couple notable exclusive relationships of farms and restaurants in the world. And this year you can see them all over the map. It's a global phenomenon. It's not uh, news any longer. Um, more and more far, uh, chefs and restaurants are sourcing from farms, and even Wikipedia has gotten into the game and has a um, farm table definition. Yeah, even though the restaurant itself, we never... oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, even though we never really called ourselves a farm to table restaurant, it was always a purely qualitative decision in moving forward. In fact, uh, visitors that we have to the restaurant, both industry people and elsewhere, one of the most frequently asked questions we have is how do you make this work? How can it work with such a small restaurant and such a large operation that's labor intensive as a farm? And how, how do we collaborate? But we're not here just to talk about us. We also want to talk about how it's possible for more restaurants to um, have an exclusive relationship with just one farm. I know a lot of you guys already sourced from farms. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a one-on-one -on -one direct relationship 
that is um, exclusive. I don't sell my product to anybody else. 100% of it goes to Man Ray Sub. And it may seem like a romantic notion, like Daniel said, um, but it, uh, it does have its trials and tribulations, and we're here to talk about those as well as um, the good times, too. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the financial, uh, how we make it work uh, so everybody is happy. So first, let's start at the beginning and talk a little bit about how we did it, how we started, and how we've evolved. As lucky as we are in Northern California with our great products, uh, we have access to many different things. Uh, we started looking for to, to create a degree of separation from other people. And the first thing I thought was, perhaps quite naively in my spare time, I would grow my own vegetables for the restaurant. Yeah, um, I, th I thought that was funny too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was very fortunate to, to make a connection with uh, a chef, Chef Alain Passard, who has a series of gardens and orchards uh, for one particular restaurant in France. And he was very generous with his information and also inviting me to visit the gardens back about 10 years ago. Um, I thought I would start growing my own vegetables. I realized this was going to probably be a problem, so I started asking farmers, friends of mine, um, if they could evaluate land for me, the viability of it, and perhaps if they could help me find someone to do this for me. Uh, Cynthia at that time was our tomato supplier for the restaurant. She was a fabulous uh, hobbyist, uh, award-winning tomato grower, mm -hmm. in which we really loved the products, and she was one of the people that I went to to ask advice about. And I, I did already own a farm. This is my original farm, and um, about 30, 35 minutes away from Man Race, I'd already owned this property and was um, very happy to, to take da uh, David up on his, uh, on his initial phone call. I remember that phone call when he asked if, uh, if I knew of any land he could grow vegetables on. And I said, I think you don't want to grow vegetables yourself. I think you want to have a professional do it. Yeah. So we started talking. Yeah, uh, we started talking. Um, uh, we agreed that we both wanted to try uh, biodynamic practices, both for the restaurants and for the farm, and we both agreed upon that. And we achieved our Demeter certification a few years ago, and um, it's tough for me to follow one of my personal heroes, Vandana Shiva. She's all about the anti-GMO, and so is the Demeter organization and biodynamics. So we do not have any GMO crops at all that we uh, supply to Manresa. We started out, and we still have a handshake deal. I'm going to have to pin you down on that, though, She's Chef. She's still waiting for the contract. <laughs> we both made significant early commitments. This is my farmhouse before I um, took out the lawn. She also dug up her swimming pool as a level of commitment. Yeah, the there's, there's no more swimming. Um, it's, they're too busy, too busy uh, growing crops for you, Mr. And, Mr. Demanding. And for you know, a small restaurant, we, you know, we, to show our level of commitment, we bought a lot of the outbuildings. We had hoop houses and greenhouses built at the farm to show how much we were committed to the relationship. And to show uh, David's further commitment, he even sent his dad over. That's his dad help uh, put up our greenhouses. <laughs> yeah, cheap labor, cheap labor. <laughs> we agreed to start small, just eight or nine crops to begin with. And that quickly, uh, over time, that quickly ramped up to over 300 different cultivars year-round that's grown just specifically for the restaurant. Yeah, at the height of the season. So the farm has also moved to a new location. Uh, the slide isn't showing, the pictures isn't showing, but we have a new location um, that we bought three and a half years ago. I bought with a, uh, with a couple of friends of mine, um, and it's about 12, Miles, 12 minutes, 12 minutes, 12 from the minutes away from the restaurant. Uh, but it hasn't been all fun and games. This is what David looks like when we don't give him his crops. <laughs> wow. We've suffered through a lot of diseases. We've had um, Phytophthora infestans uh, affect our tomato crop one year. Uh, every year. Every year because of our relationship with Cynthia, we do a tomato celebration, a tomato weekend. Many of us all tomatoes for two or three days, and we actually had to cancel one year because of the mites we had. Yeah, because of this particular disease. We've had deer raid our garden, even though we put up deer fence. They, those bastards somehow get in and um, can eat our crop, and David's very forgiving about that. We've had mice in the garden. One morning I came out to see this, just little zippers on the, the sides of the pea pods, and it w didn't occur to me until I saw the teeth marks what was going on. They're very good at just opening it up. They don't even take it off the vine. They just open it up and... Um, extract the peas. 
And it's probably something you know a little bit more about here, but we, we've had unexpected frosts in Northern California also that have done damage. Yeah, you guys can't, in Copenhagen, you can't relate to the fact that sometimes we are uh, surprised by this. We've, had, we've suffered through horrible pests. This is uh, cucumber beetles completely decimating uh, squash blossom. And, and this is really what separates organic biodynamic farmers from conventional farmers. It's the um, handling of the pests. Yeah. Gophers uh, have, uh, we've <laughs> had horrible um, problems with gophers too when we first moved in. Lots of gopher holes, just trap, 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 trying to get these um, guys like uh, Caddyshack. And at the very beginning, we went through periods where we grew way too much of stuff that we couldn't deal with. Everybody who's grown squash knows what I'm talking about. We had a lot of lettuces. Um, uh, and also on the flip side, uh, product that we wanted to use on a regular basis, uh, we would gap, we'd go through periods where uh, the beds wouldn't be ready. It's tough to make sure he has beets every harvest 52 weeks out of the year, but we try. We, despite our difficulties, despite these minor difficulties, the relationship still works for us and we're happy to have it. But we want to talk to you about how an exclusive uh, farm restaurant collaboration um, can work for you and can benefit you as well. Uh, yep. uh, it is exclusive. Uh, it's the fact that uh, we can just concentrate on what's growing with Cynthia, working in tandem with her, and she can concentrate on her passion, which is growing things, and not having to worry to, to sell or to unload the product. So let's talk about what, how it can benefit a restaurant. I can specify exactly what I want grown for the restaurant and the quantities and amounts. And what you don't want grown. And exact, yeah, exactly what I don't want to grow, waste valuable space. When David first uh, and I first uh, partnered, um, I had a beautiful herb garden and some fabulous varieties of sage. And he said, pull them all out, don't like sage, never will like sage. So I had to take it out. Hate it, hate it. <laughs> Still hates it. I can specify harvest sizes and the shapes of leaves and maturity levels of almost everything, even numerous stages for one plant just to contribute to one particular dish. Yeah, so he can say, um, I want my radishes exactly one inch in diameter, I want a stalk on it four inches long, I don't want anything else on there, Toscano kale, I want it exactly this length, um, and he can, and we do that for him. And of course the best thing to uh, exclusivity, I can have uh, access to all stages of plants during its various growth. Uh, uh, roots, shoots, uh, mature and immature leaves, seeds, stems, and flowers. And that's Sometimes hard. just not available commercially. Right, it's hard to get at a farmer's market every part of that plant that he wants. Um, part of my job is sourcing rare cultivars, so um, in the winter months, even though we're still growing for him, I have a little bit of a respite and I can start looking up uh, encyclopedias and plant thing, um, plant um, um, esoteric plant varieties to acquire the seeds and to grow them for David and, and further help differentiate his restaurant. And get the freshest stuff around. It's about 10 minutes from the restaurant. Uh, what a difference 12 hours can make with really, really fragile foodstuffs. Yeah, even at a farmer's market, those, pro those products have been picked either the day before or the day before that, never that morning. So we pick them, um, we handle them very gently, and we take them to the restaurant uh, in the most loving way possible. And what's even really cool, too, is that uh, the entire restaurant staff, both front of house and back of house, uh, they're interested, they can participate. Uh, a lot of stages and externs are required to spend time at the farm also, uh, which is a great carryover. I walk around the farm with David on occasion, and I don't even say anything because I could just see the wheels turning in his head as he walks by uh, from crop to crop, getting ideas of what he's going to do with that veg later. Wheels turning, wheels turning. And of course, exclusivity with one farm can help with publicity. I know it's helped my farm greatly, and I hope in some small way it's helped Man Raisa too. And we have a lot of guests at the restaurant who want to see the farm too to complete their experience, which is really great. So we understand that this arrangement, this relationship is not um, for every restaurant, but we did want to talk about how to craft it if it's something that you think uh, would be beneficial to you. So there are basically three types of the, this relationship, the Love Apple model, which is partnering with an already existing farm exclusively, and then two, 
um, when a restaurant already owns land or has access to land and they just have to hire a farmer to um, put in a garden for them. And then lastly, a restaurant doesn't own any land, they don't know a farmer, or they don't have a gardener in mind, and they have to find both of those things. Uh, the first one, of course, is the relationship that Cynthia and I have, in which I found an already established farm who is willing to work with me. And so one of the benefits of that is that there's no land investment, and you can trust that you've got an experienced farmer because they've already been farming. Uh, the, the downside is it's a lot harder to find than you think. A lot of farmers are set in their ways. They're not willing to commit to a risky business of supplying just one customer and certainly not restaurant. As we all know, restaurants open and restaurants close. Right, and the farm may already have sufficient um, buyers for their products. They may not want to put all their eggs in one basket and go with you exclusively, so you may not be able to entice them. Uh, and again, the farm may not want to take the risk with partnering just with one source. Diversity reduces risk, so uh, it, it might be difficult to, to talk them into it. And uh, the farmer can quit also. You know, it's a farmer. It might be tough. They might not find it viable, uh, and they might have every viable reason to walk away from the project. There was a time about three years into our relationship when I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. It's too hard. I cannot do it. And then David talked me out of the tree, and here we are five years later, still going strong. It is probably the fastest and easiest way to establish the relationship, though, is finding uh, an already existing farm. Yeah, after we, after we started the commitment, we had product in a matter of weeks. Right. The first harvest, I think, was three weeks in, and um, he called me up on the phone and said it was great, and I said, Yahoo, let's, let's go for it. So how do you find such a farm? You may already know of a farmer to ask, or you could get a referral from a trusted friend if that farm is not, or you can get a referral from that farm if that particular farm isn't um, interested. Yeah, your already known sources, other farmers you might know, sources at the farmer's markets or various farms. Yep, go down the farmer's market and start asking. You can also check out this website. It's international. It's fabulous. It's called localharvest.org. There's, there's over 30,000 farms lo um, on localharvest.org with all their contact information on there. And what should you expect to pay? This, this is the single largest question that we are asked, is how do you make it work? Right. And it does depend on the location, how, um, how expensive your real estate is around you. We are in Santa Cruz, uh, California, and that's one of the most expensive pieces of real estate in the United States, and it also depends on the size of the farm. Bigger, of course, is gonna be more expensive, and the number of crops, too. If our animals are involved, that substantially increases costs, yeah, even animal. though it adds diversity. Yeah, animals are a huge expense. Uh, and the best tip is really uh, not to worry about weight, fee, paying for bunches of carrots. Our arrangement is, is that we pay a monthly fee at the beginning of the month, we pay a not insubstantial amount of money to have access to everything that grows at the farm and the first dibs. This allows us, it frees us up in the kitchen to cook and to work with the products that come in, spend our time planning, and Cynthia can spend time doing what she does best, which is growing things. And realize that the farmer has to pay, ha, you have to, have to charge for that exclusivity because they are losing an opportunity to sell their excess to somebody else. And we also have to charge um, an extra fee for the specialty harvesting. We're always getting maybe a last minute phone call. Hey, we don't quite have enough borash flowers. Can you pick some and deliver them to the restaurant? So that, ex that extra handling and harvesting has got has to cost you something, David. <laughs> uh, number two, the second form is you have land already, but you need to find a farmer. A uh, great example is uh, the French Laundry, a very famous restaurant in Northern California, also for years had abandoned land that they wanted to develop across the way. And just recently, they planted a really impressive kitchen garden. Yep, they had the land and they hired a farmer and put in a farm. You may already have land and you don't, um, you don't even know it, like this beautiful rooftop garden in Brooklyn. A uh, restaurant investor might have nearby suitable land so that, you'd be, that they'd be willing to let you use uh, for the project. You don't even have to have a large piece of land. It could just be a little plot at the end of the street corner. That, that'll get you started. And probably the single most important thing is accessibility. If you have a farm that's two and a half hours away from the restaurant, it almost defeats the purpose of having the relationship. 
or the land might be too clay, it might be too near the coast to really get a full feel for what you want to grow. One of the other um, good things about this relationship, this second form, is that you can handpick your farmer to um, match your aesthetic, match what you um, are trying to do in your restaurant. Uh, and this, of course, takes a lot of longer, too, because you're starting up. You have startup costs. Yeah, you're not going to get crops within three weeks with this one. You have to be a little bit more patient. So how do you find a farmer for your existing land? Here's Dan Barber and his farmer. Uh, you can go on to this fabulous website. There's lots of websites like this. As a matter of fact, this is a biodynamic farming and gardening website uh, worldwide as well. Put an advertisement on there for a farmer. I think we all understand the importance of social media and getting any kind of message out there that you want. It's a great way to find help. That's how y'all you all are um, getting your uh, sous chefs these days and wait staff, right? Um, or you can find your farmer at Love Apple. We're opening a farmer university where we're training just a small handful um, of uh, students to farm exclusively for fine dining restaurants. And it is a different way of farming. It really is quite different than tractors and and all that stuff. Yeah, we have, uh, there's uh, several graduates from Love Apple Farms that are running uh, farms and gardens for various high profile restaurants in the Bay Area now. Yeah, we just wish they would wait until they graduate. They come in and they pinch my students before they're finished. Um, in this scenario though, the farmer is usually an employee and the restaurant pays for the land and all the equipment in that second form. Yeah, and you have to expect to pay them as an employee. It's just like a kitchen job. It's not a 40-hour work week. You know, they're really, really committed in farming life. Yeah, if, you, if your farmer wants to work 40 hours a week, fire her. It's not a 40-hour week job. Uh, startup costs can be substantial from the very beginning. It's, uh, do not underestimate how much money it takes to get things going. Including that farmer salary. And then after that, it goes down a little bit, but there's always a lot to, uh, to pay for. And you'll need additional hands because one farmer is never enough. I think it takes us about 30 man hours per harvest for uh, Manresa. Okay. And the last form is number three in which you have no land and you have no farmer. What do you do? <laughs> and you got to find them both. So um, find the farmer first because a farmer's expertise is going to be able to find the land for you. Um, she knows what she's uh, looking at and knows it better than, than you do. Do let that farmer live on the land, though, because there's no substitute for exacting attention to detail 24-7. Certainly during startup. Especially during startup. And of course, this last collaboration is going to be the most expensive because you have to find the land and you have to find the farmer. You're, you're simply, you're paying for it all. You're paying for all the housing, the startup costs, salaries, uh, outbuildings, just everything. We're talking developed. them out of it, David. We're supposed to be talking them into it. <laughs> So be careful on both of these, all of these forms of collaboration though. Um, it, th there's a risk of the farm failing, there's a risk of the restaurant failing. You're not going to go out of business anytime soon, are you David? Okay, good. Uh, and there's a risk of the crop failure like the tomatoes. Yeah. And of course, uh, finding qualified personnel, it's the same thing as hiring a non-qualified sous chef or chef de cuisine to run your kitchen. You want to find someone who really buys into your vision and what you want to carry out. Yeah, I think this is, a, this is the second biggest tip we were going to impart to people is do not hire your girlfriend's nephew just because he thinks he might be able to throw a seed in the ground, water it, and get crops for you. This is an important point. They've got to be qualified. And how do you find that qualified farmer in addition to all the other things that we've said? Um, again, get a referral from a trusted farmer. Um, or you can even hire a consultant to find your farmer, find your land, get it going, and then walk away. That's a possibility too. Um, and those possible consultants or head farmers that already have a relationship um, with uh, a restaurant. Again, this type of farming is, is very different from normal farming. So you really want to um, get that, um, that expertise. Yeah, this relationship, I mean, it, it might very well work for you. I know it, it does for us. It's been the single largest challenge that we've had at the restaurant in the past six years, but unequivocally, I think it's the most satisfying also. There's, the closed circle, uh, the waste, the composting that comes back, the seed saving operations, the collaboration and planting crops. I think the single most, the coolest thing that we do is not that we just grow a bunch of stuff and we try to use it, but we custom grow the amounts just to show as much respect and lack of wastefulness as we possibly can. Yeah, that's it's been really great. Very satisfying relationship. So does this sort of exclusive farmer restaurant collaboration take guts? I think so. I think so too. But no guts, no glory. Yep. 
Cheers. Thank you.